17 on endometrial carcinoma. At the outset, I would like, like to thank NOGS and Department OBGY JNMC for giving me this opportunity. Without much delay, I request Dr. Sushma Deshmukh, ma'am, Honorable President NOGS, to give the welcome address. A very good evening to all. Friends, this is a really, really very uh, good season because we are all celebrating Christmas and we are all in the celebration mode. And uh, recently, we also completed this, our wonderful conference as an Akpuristos Kubi Carnival with a good, good success. You all have witnessed it in a really, it was very nice. And today, it gives me celebration like feeling to welcome you all on this wonderful PG webinar, PG star webinar with our Nagpur Obijaya Society in association with the Datta Megi Institute of Medical Sciences. Friends, this is our series 17th. And today, we are going to discuss endometrial cancer. We know that it is really, cancer means really it is very uh, dreadful things for the patients also and for we also while treating. And we need to know very important things while uh, evaluating the patient. So that's why we can, in this uh, end of this year, we can just have this in mind that we'll just uh, learn so many things about the cancer so that we can be happier in the uh, next year. And it will be a very happy year for, for all of us. So for this, Dr. Swati Dahifre decided to take uh, to venture to present this case of C endometrium. And for this, we are having examiner as Dr. Virendra Kumar. Uh, we know uh, from Bellari, he's a uh, terrific academic person. And we are listening to him since many years. And really, sir, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Rajasi Sen Gupta, our own uh, assistant professor, Datta, this uh, Datta Magi. And really, both are very good academician. And they will solve all the problems regarding uh, this endometrium. Welcome to all. Then the second one is the pulse of wisdom. And the topic is on update on endometrial cancer. So I uh, welcome Dr. Nisha Singh, a really uh, amazing person. And who is, she is going to, we, she will take you through the different, different aspects of, uh, and we need to know the update, what is happening nowadays. And it will be a very good academic feast for all of us. And the chairpersons are Dr. Chandan Kachru and Dr. Asha Jain. Welcome chairperson and Dr. Nisha Singh. And you know the all the uh, conveners, Dr. Anuja Bhalerao, Dr. Bhakti Guzra, Dr. Prashi Dikshi, they are really the you know, uh, main support for conducting this PG Star CME. And uh, you all the audience, PG every time because last uh, few days back, I had been to Chandrapur. One lady, one uh, young PG student, she came to me and she told me, ma'am, actually I wait for your PG star series. So it's a very good gesture for me. So I think it is, day by day has become popular because uh, the faculties are very nice and uh, my secretary, Dr. Pragati is also there to deal all these things. Then uh, MOC is Dr. Megha Karni, really. So all are doing, she, she decided to uh, so tie everyone in a one string. So again, I welcome you all and we'll start without delay. We'll start the series. Thank you very much. So we begin with the first session of the evening, which is the case presentation on postmenopausal bleeding. We have with us today respected Dr. Virendra Kumar sir and Dr. Rajeshi Sen Gupta ma'am as the esteemed examiners. As we know, Sir is a professor and unit head of Department OBGY WIMS, Ballari. Sir has been the president of Ballari Obstetrics Gynecology Society from 2019 to 21. Sir has a 22 years of teaching experience. Sir has organized various live workshops and CMEs. And he has delivered the Professor P.K. Devi Oration at Nagpur and uh, delivered a Dr. Vatri Oration in Sangvi. He has more than 100 presentations as a faculty and published numerous papers in various journals. He is the master trainer of HDP in pregnancy certificate course and contributed chapters in various textbooks. Our second examiner is Dr. Rajasi Sengupta Ma'am. She is professor at DMMC and SMHRC, Vana Dongdi Nagpur. She has special awards and achievements and has been awarded the FICOG at AICOG Bangalore 2019. Present yes, ma'am. We can cut it short and go to the case right yes, away. So with our experienced uh, examiners, I hand over Dr. Swati Dahi Fai, who is junior resident year three, to present with her case. Swati, over to you. 
गुड इवनिंग मैम इट सेज होस्ट डिसेबल्ड पार्टिसिपेंट स्क्रीन शेयरिंग आई कैन नॉट शेयर माई स्क्रीन वेट मैम जस्ट अमेर Um, can you please recheck? Yes, I can share my screen. Good evening, respect faculty. My name is Dr. Swati Deepre. I am third year postgraduate resident in Department of Obstetric and Gynecology in Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Savangi. Today, I am presenting a case of postmenopausal bleeding. Uh, my patient is a 55 year old post menopausal woman belonging to middle socio economic status she is para to living to and to victimize 32 years back uh, she came with a complaint of bleeding per vagina since 2 months uh, she was apparently asymptomatic 2 months back then she noticed uh, bleeding through vagina which was initially mild with soakage of only half pad per day in gradually it increased over to 3 to 4 pads fully soaked per day with passage of clots uh, bleeding was not associated with pain in abdomen uh, she is sexually not active since last to seven uh, last seven to eight years there is no history of similar complaints of bleeding per vagina in the past there is no history of post coital bleeding during sexually active years uh, there is no history of bleeding per uh, bleeding through any other orifices uh, bleeding per rectum hematuria or hematemesis Uh, no history of any mass coming out of vagina or weight loss or loss of appetite there is no history of trauma fever or pain uh, she has never received menopausal hormonal therapy and she has not been screened for uh, cancers like pap smear uh, she is married for 37 years oh, wait, she wait. has two children wait swati so uh, when do you call as a case as a post menopausal bleeding um uh, She when do you define a, what is the definition of post menopausal bleeding uh, sh- there are no menses for 12 months huh? and hmm. bleeding after that it will be post menopausal okay bleeding. so whenever you are evaluating a case of post menopausal bleeding what is your concern why we have to take any post menopausal bleeding as a serious issue okay. so post menopausal bleeding can be due to malignancy so yes. we have to evaluate Yes, so we have to check whether suppose it's malignancy a patient, or. Other. Suppose a patient comes to you, and you will say that you, you may have malignancy, and then, uh, hmm? is it like that? No, so there are other causes also. Okay, so what is the hmm. cause of uh, how, what is the percentage of having uh, CA endometrium or uh, genital tract malignancy in such patients? So ten percent can be due to CA endometrium. Other causes, most common cause is atrophic endometritis. Hmm. But five to ten percent can also be due to malignancy. Yeah, it is not five to ten percent. It is around one to fourteen percent. It depends on which country you are evaluating. Suppose in okay. India, it may be less. Suppose if you take in Western countries or in America, the incidence could be as high as fourteen percent. Okay, the range is around one to fourteen percent. What? So one to fourteen percent of the postmenopausal bleeding women can have C endometrium. At the same time, yes. remaining ninety percent or ninety five percent can have benign causes. Benign okay. causes. As, as you told, uh, you have told so many negative history. You have probably or ruled out so many other causes. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. Why do you think pay, uh, women will have postmenopausal bleeding? What is the cause? For for example, you told atrophic endometrium, right? Yes, sir. One of the major cause of bleeding uh, during postmenopausal period is uh, yes. atrophic endometrium. Why atrophic endometrium will have bleeding? Nothing is there, no. Yes. Sir. Then why is they should bleed? Right? Okay. There are. I'll tell you the answer because we have very less time. Because atrophic endometrium as well as atrophic vagina, they are not static organs. They are all dynamic organs, and they are collapsed. Even endometrium is collapsed and vagina is collapsed. When collapsing occurs, there will be friction between the two surfaces, both anterior surface, posterior surface, as well as the vagina. So, because of this, there will be micro abrasion occurs inside. Because they are not well supported by glandular support, they will have either 
endometritis or they may have infection. This is the reason why they will have bleeding. No. Simply atrophic endometrium will not bleed because uterus is a dynamic organ. There will be constant small contractions will be happening and there is no. friction between this endometrium. Okay. Otherwise, you will have doubt why endometrium should have atrophic endometrium yes. should have bleeding. And similarly, senile vaginitis because yes. of the, the microvasculature, they can have bleeding. Okay. Yes. Continue. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Uh, obstetric injury. She is married for 37 years. Uh, she is para to living to both were full term vaginal delivery uh, and she is tubectomized 32 years back. Hmm. Uh, she no, attained no. her what is, the relation, what is the relation of parity and the postmenopausal bleeding or with related Nali to your case? Nulliparous women uh, will tend to have more risk of C endometrium than uh, more pa uh, women with more parity due to estrogen. Okay, okay. nulliparous women are more likely to have. What is the percentage relative risk? What is the relative risk? Suppose you have para to living to, and an another woman is there, nulli paras. What is the chance of nulli paras woman, chance of having a CA endometrium or a genital tract malignancy? It is called as relative risk. Or relative. Hmm. What is the percentage? Because you asked so many negatives, no? that's why I'm asking. Yeah. She did not use any hormonal therapy. She did not have, you have ruled out, nice thing, you have ruled out. What is the relative risk? Related For example, risk, I don't know. Nulli paras will have higher risk, but I do not know, sir, related it, it is around 2, 2 to 2.5 percent, 2 to 2.5 factors. Okay. okay. They are 2 to 2.5 times more okay. than the paras. Okay. okay. So okay. this is, this you, risk factor is very important. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You told about nulli parity relationship with CA endometrium. Mm. Yes, ma'am. But do you want to comment about CA cervix? Can that be one of your causes of postmenopause yes. bleeding? Yes, ma'am. Is nulliparity also cannot... a risk factor for CA cervix? Or multiparity? Here what we is are the not risk factor in cervical the... cancer? See, the ultra of C endometrium, multi-parity, more paras women are more likely to have CS cervix, right? More sexual. Ah. Early onset of sexual activity. Sexual activity. Multiple partners. Mm. That can mm. be one of the causes of postmenopausal bleeding. So you have to keep it in mind when you take your history. Yes. Yeah. See, yes. here you know that it is a case of C endometrium, but in examination, you cannot tell like that. You yes. have to know all aspects of... Uh, Genital tract malignancy. Yes. Okay. Uh, my patient attained menarche at the age of 13 years. Uh, during her menstrual uh, reproductive wear, she had regular cycles of 28 to 30 days with bleeding for 4 days, with soakage of 2 to 3 pads, half soak per day, with no history of passage of clots or dysmenorrhea. Uh, she attained her menarche at the age of 50 years, that is 5 years back. Is it normal? Is it normal attending menopause at the age of 50 years? Yes, sir. Up to uh, up to fifty years is normal. Sir. No, what uh, is what average are... age in Indian women versus in Caucasian women? You have to know the average age of menopause in Indian ladies. Forty-five to fifty years for Indian women. No. Please 45. tell me the specific answer. Is it the same for Western women and no, women? So, in whom it will be later? Any guesswork? We don't know in the Indian. beginning. Uh, the Western Indian women are more likely to have endometrial carcinoma, means they are more likely to have later menopause compared to Indian women. Right? Mm. Okay. Yes. It is 51 years in Caucasians and 47.5 in Indian women. Okay? Exactly. Mm. Remember. Yeah, what is the relation of menopause and say endometrium? Uh, if she achieved menopause earlier, that means less exposure of estrogen, there will be uh, lesser risk of C endometrium. If menopause is attained later, there will be late more menopause. You can give a specific answer instead of telling uh, like this. Late menopause and early menarch are more associated with chance of more uh, uh, like that. You should tell. Uh, okay. Okay. Continue. Uh, past history, there is no history of diabetes, hypertension, thyroid disorders, asthma. There is no history of blood transfusion in the past. Uh, she had only wait, 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 wait. You are asking no history of diabetes, hypertension. 
is it like routinely asking or is there any specific reason uh, hypertension thyroid disorder these are uh, associated with ca endometrium also and this should be screened in every patient okay what about pcos pcos is also high risk for ca endometrium as it uh, more unopposed estrogen so okay. it will uh, also increase the risk of ca endometrium. how what much is corpus cancer syndrome what is the trial of corpus trial cancer of hypertension obesity and diabetes right okay. And how Suppose is PCOS a risk factor? Ma'am, PCOS, there will be more unovulatory cycles. So that is a more unopposed estrogen, which will increase yes. a risk of CN. Okay. Any relation uh, between obesity? We... Because most of the time we see... Yes, uh, obesity, there will be more fat. So more conversion of androgens to estrogen hmm. uh, due to uh, aromatization of fat, which will also increase... What is the relative estrogen. risk? What is the relative risk? For example, a woman who is just overweight, who is morbidly obese, whether they carry the same risk? So morbidly obese will carry more risk than uh, overweight? No, you should know a specific answer. Yes. Anybody can guess, but what is the risk factor? For example, our BMI mm -hmm. is more than 35. It is morbidly obesity, right? Yeah. How yes. much? It is 10 times more than the woman who has got normal weight. Okay, you must know all these things because CA endometrium, anybody can tell what is the staging and all. But as a post gazette, as a really clinician, you must know all these things. Okay? Yes. Sir. Right. So, morbidly obese women, relative risk factor is 10, 10 times. Mm -hmm. 10, 10. Okay. Uh, family history, there is no history of ovarian, breast, or. Uh, no, no, you have asked no history of blood transfer in the past. What does it mean? Why you so asked that? Uh, any relation between some... CA endometrium and blood transfusion? Or no, any... sir, she came with complaint of bleeding uh, through vagina. So if she has shown outside or transfused with blood. So I wanted to know that history. No, that is, a, that is not a past history. That will be a present history. It is a continuation of her symptoms. It cannot come in past. Okay. okay. Uh, there is no history of ovarian breast, uh, endometrial uh, cancer or any malignancy in the family. Hmm. Uh, personal history. Why, why, are asking this? why are you asking this? So, uh, CA endometrium has a genetic uh, link as well. There is mutation of gene that can be passed down uh, hmm. in generation. So, I wanted to know what if is that her syndrome mother known or as? sister... What's that? What is that syndrome? Suppose you ask no genetic predisposition baby there in certain families. Lynch 2 syndrome, sir. Hereditary hmm. non-polyposis colorectal cancer. Okay. So, that is the the one which has got uh, genetic maximum, link. maximum relative risk of developing. It is almost 20 times more than in normal population. Normal. Okay. okay. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, what age you should do the testing for oncogenes? When do you perform testing? What is the optimum age? And if it turns positive, then what is your plan of management? Suppose the oncogen comes positive yes. and patient is she already high risk of colon cancer and endometrial malignancy. So then what do you do? At then what age you would want to test this patient? Okay, read, read. Sorry, ma'am, I do not know that. Okay. Um, she has normal sleep pattern. Her bowel and bladder habits are regular. There is no history of smoking, tobacco, alcohol consumption or any addictions. Uh, examination. patient On examination, patient is conscious, oriented to time, place and person. Her weight is 54 kg, height is 150 cm and BMI is 24 kg per meter square. Uh, Pallor is present. Uh, there is no edema, cyanosis, clubbing, icterus or lymphadenopathy. Uh, her pulse is 90 per minute, regular. Blood pressure is normal. You can go to directly genital tract examination. Hmm. Uh, per, on per abdominal examination, on That's inspection. That's okay, you, because we don't discuss all those things. Ah, right. Local examination, uh, external genitalia is normal. There's past big hair seen, uh, labia major or minor are normal. There's no growth or lesion seen or perineum or labia. External urethral meatus normal and uh, no hemorrhoids or skin tags uh, seen on local. You should not write normal, you should write appropriate for the age. Okay. You cannot yes. write normal, appropriate for the age. Better That is the better terminology. 
right okay uh first speculum examination was done which showed cervix vagina healthy there was no growth or polyp seen on cervix no growth seen in vagina uh, blood was altered dark color blood was seen trickling out of cervical os on first speculum examination uh, biomanual examination is done uh, was done where cervix forming consistency it surface was regular directed downwards and backwards uterus was 12 week size antiverted and mo mobile Uh, bilateral fornices are free there is no nodularity felt in pouch of douglas and there was no cervical motion tendency uh, per rectal examination was done tone of external anus sphincter good no growth felt in rectum rectal mucosa free no mass felt through the anterior rectal wall and bilateral uh, parametrium free there is no nodularity felt in pouch of douglas and uh, on per rectal examination no blood was stained on gloved finger What is the purpose of doing per rectal examination? So when she complains of bleeding per vagina, sometimes hmm. it can also be bleeding through rectum, which hmm. uh, she might get confused when she uh, sees blood on. That is one. Okay. Hmm. So it can also Any be uh, hemorrhoids or uh, malig associated malignancy in colon. So we should rule no, out no, that. No, 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 no. We have to tell in 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 the pers uh, in the perspective of genital tract malignancy. Yes. What is the relation of doing PR in the case of genital? You are suspecting genital Suspect. tract malignancy. Yes, sir. Spread to sir uh, bowel mucosa. Yes. Uh, Does uh, why is it important? Why do you want uh, to know that? If mass is felt through per rectal examination, that means the genital malignancy has spread to bowel mucosa, and it is higher. Uh, Stage of cancer. Okay. Right. How many times would have seen? We are yes. at to see even grade four uh, C endometrium. More common answer is because in India, which is the common cancer in India? Which cancer among women? Gynecological CSR, cancer CSR. is the C S cervix. Okay. C S. So sometimes we may have we may have okay. endo cervical growth or adenocarcinoma. Okay. Oh. External cervix may be normal. So we want to see how is the parametrium. Or is there anything? So instead of telling all these hemorrhoids or colon cancer, we should concentrate on our field. Okay. Yes. Sir. That also again, C S cervix more important for us than C endometrium. Yes. C endometrium is important, but more important but is C S cervix. C S cervix is more common. Yeah. So basically, to look for parametrium, to look for any suspected uh, ovarian malignancy, all this nodularity you told me. No? So don't mm -hmm. tell the answer of colon cancer or hemorrhoids or C rectum. To we'll talk about mm -hmm. genital tract malignancy. Okay. Yes. But in your findings here in per rectal examination, you have not actually commented in the cervical area, which you should as a gynecologist yes. doing a PR. You should you comment. Must the... tell to anterior rectal. In where, but in the region of cervix. That's what you should yeah. say. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Ah, uh, summary. My patient is fifty-five year old, postmenopausal female, para to living to. So what next? What What will you do for her now? Um, so I have uh, done investigation, sir. Mm -hmm. Hemoglobin is eight point three gram percent. WSC count is eight thousand six hundred per cubic millimeter. Platelet is two point two lakhs per cubic millimeter. Peripheral blood show normocytic, normochromic RBCs. Hemoglobin electrophoresis uh, showed uh, a pattern of hemoglobin. Her uh, bleeding time, clotting time, coagulation profile was within normal. Uh, okay. As her hemoglobin, as her hemoglobin was eight point three gram percent, we transfused her to uh, packed red uh, PRC. Uh, USG was done, which showed uterus majors ninety one millimeter by seventy three millimeter by fifty four millimeter shows coarse myometrium. Uh, the endometrial cavity reveals hype. The endometrial cavity reveals hypoechoic heterogeneous contents with minimal vascularity. Endometrial thickness is twenty two millimeter. There was no focal lesion seen, no adnexal mass noted, uh, no free fluid in cul de sac, and liver and spleen were normal. Hmm. Uh, okay, okay, we we'll done... go to that later. Okay. What is the role of Pap smear in such cases? What is the role of Pap smear in postmenopausal bleeding? Whether you would uh, like to get Pap uh, Pap smear in this patient? Yes, sir. So hmm. we did Pap smear also, which was negative for malignant cells. Hmm. Right. No. Uh, what is the cervical cancer is more? What is the typical report of Pap smear? How do you describe 
a typical normal pap smear report what do you mean by nilm suppose some if you re, what system you are following yes sir that, what system you are following for pap smear reporting bethesda system bethesda hmm. bethesda bethesda okay there in the footnote they would have written nilm means what n i l m it is negative for intraepithelial Malignant. lesion or malignancy Malignant. you should not sell only malignancy it is always n i l m is there any role of pap smear yes sir as cervical cancer is most common cause uh, we should rule out cs cervix also can we rule out endometrial malignancy by pap smear Mm -hmm. Asmear is not only for uh, CA cervix, no. Yes, sir. Some this is exfoliative setter. Whatever cells are shed into the vagina, you are collecting it. Okay. Yes. Sometimes you may get yes. even the suspicious cells. Yes, sir. Cervical and endometrial. Okay. So yes. any pap smear suspicious cells, if you get on pap smear, it is uh, you are bound duty to rule out both CA cervix as well as CA endometrial. Yes. I am not talking about this patient in general. Yeah. If you have any suspicious, okay. So, what are the yeah. suspicious cells you are likely to have? You will have ascus or agus. You know what is ascus? A S C U S. Yes, sir. Ah, okay. Sometimes C endometrium can also shed abnormal cells into the endocervical so, canal or into the vagina. So you may pick up endometrial can, but it is not recommended to screen C endometrium through Pap smear. That you should understand. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Hmm. So what is the best training modality for C endometrium then? C endometrium surgery uh, is the best modality. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. Screening. Huh. I'm asking screening. Like Pap smear sir just now said that it is better for cervical malignancy. Yes, ma'am. So no, biopsy of endometrium by Biopsy of endometrium. Biopsy is a screening method. Do you think screen. you can say it Diagnostic. is a screening method? No, diagnosed. Diagnosed. So you should say that as as far as C endometrium concerned, there is no reliable specific screening mm -hmm. test available. That should be your mm -hmm. answer, right? Okay. But still, we can do some screening. How do you do that? Uh, at least in high risk patients. You have written some endometrial thickness, 22 mm. Can uh, we yes, sir. can we use ultrasonogram as a screening model at least to some extent, even though it doesn't qualify? Yes, sir. As thickened a... endometrium will show. Um, mm, what thickened? In a postmenopausal woman, when do you call it a thickened endometrium? Uh, if it's uh, endometrial thickness is more than 15 millimeter, it's a uh, significant 50. and should uh, no, endometrial. No, no. No, 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 no. Come again. What come is again? the cutoff? What is the cutoff of endometrial thickness on a TVS in a postmenopausal woman to raise a high index of suspicion of malignancy? Five millimeter. Five millimeter. Okay, I say four mm. Four millimeters. Yes. Suppose somebody will say three mm. What is the correct answer? Suppose so if you take. Suppose if you take 5 mm, how many malignancy C endometrium you will miss? Hmm? Suppose if you take 5 mm, how many yes. malignancy will miss? So that's why we want to have really most of the people will cause 99%. So 99% hmm. negative predictive value is there for 4 mm cutoff. 4 mm. Okay. So yes. 5 mm is not 99%. Okay. So even if you take 4 mm, still you can miss some, some malignancy. Mm -hmm. Suppose if the thickness is 3 mm, 99% unlikely that she has C endometrium. That is the mm -hmm. meaning of that. Okay. So 4 mm, mm suppose how many cases you will miss? For 4 mm, so 99% chance it's not a malignancy, 1% it can be. Uh, no, actually, according to the study, they have conducted study, 1 in 3, 39 cases may be missed if you take 4 mm. 
okay if you take 5 mm one in 250 cases may be missed whereas if you take 3 mm one in 380 may be missed so because the difference between 380 and 340 is very less the research have set the cut off at 4 mm oh got it this is not 5 mm nowadays yeah, we ca consider 4 mm because negative predictive value is 99% Okay. So, Swati, your Thank patient's you. endometrial thickness is how much? Twenty-two millimeter, ma'am. So, is it normal? No, ma'am. But can you have some other diagnosis rather than malignancy with this type of? Yes, ma'am. Endometrial hyperplasia can also have endometrial th high endometrial. Okay. Hmm. What would you more want to rule out? I will want to rule out malignancy. No, no, no. I that is all. That is the first. diagnosis. Any At other 22 case? 22 mm. Other than malignancy, is there anything mm. else on your mind which you want to rule out? And that too, she is bleeding heavily. That it is a malignancy. It can be anything else. Yes, ma'am. Benign lesion like uh, endometrial uh, hyperplasia, endometrial polyps. Polyp. Yeah. Polyp. Polyp is more the that. answer. Okay. Yes. Hyperplasia. The, your eco texture will be able to tell you. And a hyperplasia of 22, very less likely. Anything around 2 centimeters, first thing you should rule out is a polyp. If this is not a postmenopausal, if she is a premenopausal woman, a younger girl with 22 mm ET, a good technique to do imaging of a polyp is. What will you do? Huh? No, no, no. Why? Why do you want to burn a hole in her pocket, dear? Your college is rich for everybody will do MRI. Huh? What is the simplest test, Emma, to rule out polyp? Have you heard of sonosalpingogram, sonohistogram? What is SIS? Yes. What is SIS? Saline, infusion, infusion. sonogram. Sonogram. It is also yeah. called a sonohistogram or SIS, saline infusion sonogram. That is yes, the cheapest. Sir, sir. It can be on outpatient basis. MRI yes. is reserved for uh, yes, other cases. Okay. See, what is the, uh, like, how do you, you should estimate endometrial thickness? Suppose you are doing TVS. How do you estimate endometrial yes. thickness? In what axis? Is it transverse axis or longitudinal axis? Suppose the endometrium should be seen from fundus to the cervix up to cervical canal. And when where do you take the thickness? Suppose at uh, fundus it may be more, at uh, some level it may be less. Which one you will take? Um, sir, I do not know, sir. Ultrasonogram. Yes, ultrasonogram. Yes, ultrasonogram. Gynecologist should be the ultrasonologist. You cannot depend on radiologist. Every yes. gynecologist should learn ultrasound. At least our own organ. We should know how to do scanning. You should not depend on others. Okay. Yes. It is yes. anteroposterior. The measurement is taken in the longitudinal axis of the uterus. The maximum endometrial echo is taken. Suppose in one year it may be 3 mm and another year it may be 6 mm. You are going to take the maximum thickness rather than the lower thickness. Okay. No. Yes. Right. Uh, so hysteroscopy was done. Uh, one, one minute. Moderates, please stop us if we are sh uh, shooting out of time. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Next, next slide. Uh, hysteroscopy was done, uh, which showed endometrium thick and fluffy. Necrotic lesion was seen near left ostia and over uh, anterior uterine wall. Bilateral ostia could not be visualized due to uh, thickened endometrium. Biopsy was taken from abnormal lesions followed by curatage of uterine cavity and those samples were sent for histopathology examination. The mm. histopathology report came back positive for endometrial carcinoma, endometrial type, type 1 endometrial carcinoma. Mm. We have called patient for follow-up for further evaluation, sir. Okay, okay. So before this, we will go to uh, management of carcinoma later. What are the, uh, suppose hysteroscopy may not be available everywhere. What are the simplest procedure you can do? So How we can do endometrial you, biopsy. You have taken a hysteroscopy guided biopsy, all right. Yes. Okay, but uh, why did you curate that uterine cavity? Not necessary. When you have taken directed biopsy, 
Yes. So the curating of the uterine cavity was not necessary. That we will come to later, little later. But for mm -hmm. a general gynecologist who does not know about uh, ABCD of hysteroscopy or sometimes hysteroscopy may not be available, then how do you take endometrial biopsy? How do you take and this hysteroscopy is all right. Mm -hmm. So endometrial biopsy, sometimes it is done even before ultras uh, the ultrasound examination, sometimes. You are in the OPD or seeing immediately you take and then send her for okay. Whether you do after ultrasound or before, that is not a question here. How do you take endometrial biopsy? With what you will take? Whether you will do DNC, like that, I am asking. Answer, Dr. Swati. Uh, yes, a biopsy. How you take biopsy? With uh, do you whether do you will do it. EB in your OPD? Do you yes, ma'am. How do you do it? Ma'am, we give uh, mesoprost to dilate cervix and uh, with the help of the endometrium biopsy forcep, we take endometrial biopsy ma and send for histopathologic. Do you need to give meso? If OS is closed. Yeah. OS will be always closed. When it will be open? Hmm? External OS may yeah. appear open. What Inter is the principle closed. of taking an EB on OPD basis? You can actually give her a meso and do a Hysteroscopy or a DNC under anesthesia. What is the difference? Sir wants to know the technique, the instrument. Is for the benefit of the advantage. people who are already. I'm sorry, sir. I think he logged off. Yeah. With what is what is the instrument equipment? What is it called? With which endometrium Have you heard of a pipel? Yes, ma'am. What is it? Instrument take biopsy. Sorry, ma'am. What is the advantage of having a pipel versus a regular uh, DNC and diagnostic hysteroscopy? What is the use? How it is? It, have you seen a pipel? Have you seen an EB curate? Hmm. Hmm? Okay. You read about it, okay? It yes, ma'am. Important endometrial sampling technique. Yes. Now, coming to the next question, suppose your sampling technique is not giving you adequate amount of tissue, then how do you go about diagnosing? EB to aap le lete ho OPD mein? फिर भेज दिया yes. हुँ? उसके बाद yes. क्या करवाते हो फिर पेशेंट को कहां भेजते हो उसके बाद सोनोग्राफी करवाते हो यस मैम हम देन व्हेन विल यू गेट द रिपोर्ट ऑफ ईबी मैम वी सेंड इट फॉर हिस्टोपैथोलॉजी एग्जामिनेशन एंड आफ्टर अ फ्यू डेज वी गेट हिस्टोपैथोलॉजी रिपोर्ट मैम सो माय क्वेश्चन इज Rather than doing an invasive procedure like a PIPEL or an EB or a DNC or a hysteroscopy, can you use TVS screening as a screening method for diagnosing malignancy? Yes, ma'am. On yes, transferring can. And in fact, it is one of the most widely used techniques nowadays. Okay. For uh, yes. cervical cancers, we have pap smears, we have uh, liquid-based cytologies. And for endometrial cancers, a good TBS with a good resolution machine can almost detect malignant looking endometrium, bad looking endometrium. Cutoff mm -hmm. for a postmenopausal is 4 millimeters. Anything mm -hmm. more than that, you have to have high index of suspicion of C endometrium and accordingly investigate. Okay. Now you tell me when this patient, where is sir? Did he log out? Hello. In this patient, sir, yeah. Uh, yeah, I lost the yeah. signal. Oh, um, we figured uh, that out. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, can we uh, have sampling failure? Sometimes you take yes, a biopsy. That's what and I asked you, you her, don't sir. have. You don't have. Uh, did you discuss this, madam, during this? Yes, uh, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. What is the percentage? No percentage. I do not know. Sir. Yeah. Sorry. Because examiners are fond of percentage because they want <laughs> to know what is the risk or what is the percentage. See, up to 40 to 50 percent of the times you can have failure. Hello? 
कैन यू हेयर मी हेलो यस सर वी 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 कैन कैन हियर हियर यू ओके ओके फाइन कंटिन्यू सी नव डेज यू शुड रिमेम्बर दैट यू शुड नॉट टेल द आंसर डी एंड सी इज ऑलवेज यू शुड टेल इधर पीपल ए और the the smallest possible cannula should be used okay yes sir okay so no answer dnc is considered as barbaric for our women we should use either the pipe le okay. or we have uh, endomed nowadays so many companies have come with a very small cannula of the diameter of maybe 3 or 4 mm you can use such things and take a sampling it is as good as dnc so ever is- ever Cases Tell where you DNC. have an access, you should always couple your DNC with a diagnostic hysteroscopy. You should not do a blind DNC if you have access to a hysteroscopy. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. In your exam, you should specify this point. But in areas where you are not working, where uh, like peripheral areas where you may not have access to a hysteroscopy, then as sir is suggesting, an EB or any type of endometrial sampling is good. Don't leave mm-hmm. the patient without doing a sampling. See another point because so many pages may be on live stream. Can we do hysteroscopy in already established case of C endometry? You are doing hysteroscopy. Yeah, you are pushing lot of fluid, and mm-hmm. you are saying that she is not sterilized. So the malignant cells may enter the peritoneal. Peritoneal spread. Is this true or your... is it only hypothetical? All effort are you are doing. Okay. What should be the pressure no. settings? Pressure. Pressure should be low to prevent uh, spread yeah. through vascular channels, sir. Yes, yes. It is said that it is only hypothetical. Hypo- if at all yeah. you are already strong suspicion and you are doing hysteroscopy, you must keep the distension pressure maybe less than eighty millimeter of mercury. If you keep it more than hundred, hundred and forty, then the risk is more. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So, what is your plan of management now for this patient? Uh, ma'am, we have called the patient for uh, evaluation and uh, management. Ma'am, uh, uh, we'll do MRI for uh, to see for spread to other organs, and uh, we'll do staging laparotomy, ma'am. Uh, is it a, what kind of staging is C endometrium? For example, CSR. Surgical staging. Clinic. Yeah, surgical. Yeah, all of it. It is it is a comprehensive surgical staging. That is the terminology used now. is no longer just surgical uh, comprehensive surgical staging okay before we go for endometrial carcinoma every gynecologist should know about endometrial hyperplasia okay what is the risk of endometrial hyperplasia and ca ca endometrium because the moment you say that endometrial you should know the percentage based on that you can offer the patient treatment why these figures are important for example you get a what are the kind of histopathological report you will have with endometrial hyperplasia what are the four types you will have endometrial hyperplasia reporting uh, simple or complex yes. with atp or without atp ah yes. right okay you got it so suppose you have complex hyperplasia without hyper, uh, without atp what is the chance of malignancy you may get the report then you as a gynecologist you should know to counsel yeah. the patient to regarding hysterectomy or is a medical non surgical treatment you should know okay sir okay so all these days even today the the famous study by kumaran 1985 that again the uh, study is not repeated if you have simple hyperplasia chance of malignancy is only 1% if you have complex hyperplasia the chance is only 3% If you have simple with ATP, it is eight percent. If you have complex with ATP, it is twenty-seven percent. So the reporting of uh, simple hyperplasia with or without, we should will know whether to counsel the patient regarding further management. Okay. Sometimes endometrial hyperplasia may have occult malignancy. The report may come as hyperplasia, endometrial hyperplasia. Still, they can have well differentiated endometrial carcinoma. What is the percentage? Again, up to twenty-five percent of the women with endometrial hyperplasia, especially in postmenopausal status, are likely to have occult malignancy. Occult. You may have missed it. Okay, so that's why all these figures help us in counseling the patient. 
just because mm-hmm. it is a simple hyperplasia you may not neglect the patient and uh, complex hyperplasia with the atp you should never take it lightly oh. right so this yes. factor about endometrial hyperplasia especially in post menopausal women you should know and uh, if it happens in pre menopausal women then you have the chance of giving them progestin therapy so this differentiation should be well known to you okay madam please continue yeah so what is the plan of management you said a surgical staging laparotomy yes what are what are the care you are going to take how are you going to proceed can you just enumerate the steps madam before you complete uh, is the histopathology report complete no that's why i am asking yeah what do you mean by type 1 type 2 suppose Sir, sometimes you you get type 2 what do you mean by type 2 so type 2 endometrial carcinoma it's a more aggressive type of can- carcinoma it's a clear cell carcinoma and type 1 mm-hmm. is less aggressive uh, endometrioid no, type not the about the aggressive or this thing type 1 is basically uh, happens estrogen it's in women uh, estrogen dependent and type 2 mm-hmm. is non estrogen non estrogen type 2 uh, happens more often in old ladies type 1 mostly perimenopausal relatively young the grade is not mentioned here okay the grade of the cancer is not mentioned that is all very important to as madam asked what steps you will take and whether it is grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 madam please yeah can you enumerate swati how you will go about with your surgery just tell uh, me the steps one by one i will do hysterectomy uh, with the bilateral salpingo hysterectomy uh, if you want to do laparoscopy or you want to do an open abdominal one or you want to go ahead for a ndvh what is your preferred route no what you do in your college you can answer uh, if it is if it is associated with prolapse we'll go for vaginal route if it's not no 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 in your case there is a prolapse in this case there is no prolapse please so, tell me about your this particular case no no abdominal hmm yeah bolo no uh, ma'am abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salping oophorectomy we will send the uh, specimen for frozen section if it okay just tell me the steps what are the care you will take when you are doing an abdominal hysterectomy for a known case of endometrial malignancy is it going to be routine like you do for a fibroid or are there going to be some changes so i might okay you have to read about it hmm? Hmm. yes ma'am yes, ma'am so whether is there any peritoneal cytology is required during uh, comprehensive yes a peritoneal surgery? cytology is uh, yeah. sent along what with the, what is the role of pelvic lymph node uh, dissection parietic lymph node dissection should we do it or not all this who will tell see it is there it is not just th bso you have to do th plus bso plus peritoneal cytology and pelvic node lymph node dissection lymph node dissection what you about parietal lymph node you read about types dissection? of hysterectomy hmm. okay yes ma'am yeah sorry what sir. is the role of parietic lymph node dissection when do you do parietic lymph node dissection for routinely we don't do it in no, 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 no. so in frozen section if the myometrial involvement is more than 50% then we go for lymph node dissection okay sometimes if you don't have frozen section depending on the is the prior histopathology report available suppose if grade 3 or more or if it is serious or the uh, clear cell carcinoma then you will do uh, otherwise at least you should do para pelvic lymph node dissection we, why we should do pelvic lymph node dissection suppose if it comes as positive whether they require any treatment extra see the survival progression free survival it is called as pfs okay ultimately the aim of surgery is as far as possible you must clear the the cancer burden in the patient okay yeah. so so that they will have progression free and cancer progression free survival one of the principle of oncology is this so we have to remove as many nodes as possible ultimately they may turn out to be 
positive if you remove maximum nodes which are positive they are more likely to survive than a patient who has not undergone pelvic lymph node dissection. Lymph dissection okay that is the principle you may not be able to do all the surgeries but at least you should know the principle yes ma'am ma yeah no i think we are good is there any role of neo adjuvant chemotherapy for ca endometrium are they available to chemo radiation would you can go for radiotherapy to prevent radi uh, we can give radiotherapy to prevent recurrence after surgery ma'am of to all cases no those who have a high risk of recurrence like uh, aggressive tumors No. In what is the was... decision for radiation and chemo post operatively depending on is it related to some factors or all malignancies you will give chemo radiation not all malignancies which what are the factors to what are the risk factors what are the surgical findings what are your reports now it's if it's to what sir just now asked you if lymph nodes are Mm. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. If lymph nodes are positive, and then yeah. uh, radiotherapy should be given uh, to prevent to prevent spread yes. to uh, distance meters. Why it will spread? You have removed it, no? Already. Yes. Then why it will spread? Give a proper answer. Please See. read about gynae oncology. It's a very yes. important topic. For your exams, yes, you, ma'am. You, you hmm? We just have two or three main cancers, and you should know everything about all ovary, cervix, and endometrium. See, there is something called as micro metastasis. Okay, yeah, that should be the answer because you would have removed physically removed the macro disease, but micro metastasis will always be there, right? That yes. is one, and every time you are telling that uh, clear cell carcinoma aggressive, what is the percentage <laughs> if you take? Suppose hundred case of endometrial carcinoma. How many will be endometrioid? How many will be clear cell? How many will be this? Uh, up to ninety percent will be most common is endometrioid. Yeah. Up to ninety cases are endometrioid. Yeah, that's why you must know only about endometrioid. See, never tell that uh, only ten percent of the patient who rarely we see. So depends yes. on the the myometrial invasion. Depends on the grade. Depends on the associated risk factors. We decide adjuvant chemotherapy. Is there any role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in such patients? What do you mean by neoadjuvant? What do you mean by neoadjuvant is uh, given before surgery and okay. adjuvant is given after surgery? Anything in between? One is after surgery. One is before mm -hmm. surgery. Anything in between is there? It is called concomitant chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Where do you give concomitant chemotherapy? In mm -hmm. which malignancy will give? concomitant chemo radiation is the uh, the order of the treatment for ca cervix understood so most of yes. new adjuvant chemotherapy is given for ca ovary adjuvant chemotherapy is given for either ca cervix yeah. or ca endometrium yeah. concomitant chemo radiation is the treatment of choice according to icmr for yeah. ca cervix yes. so yes. all these term are concomitant adjuvant all this you must know Suppose okay. this patient requires adjuvant chemotherapy. What drugs you will give? Sorry, sir. You don't know. You you must have read and come. Paclitaxel and carboplatin. Okay, that okay. is the combination which is given. Yes. Okay. Sir. Hmm. And brachytherapy is given or uh, external beam. Uh, external beam radiation. Is there any role for vaginal brachytherapy? So you must know all these things, right? Since you are presenting a case of C endometrium, it is your duty to read everything about C endometrium. Okay? Yes, sir. No. Anything else, ma'am? No, I think we are good. I think we have overshot the time ah. also. Yes, yes. Okay. So I think we have covered our most of the basic factors. No, we are not over. I think it was time uh, wonderful. Was one hour. But it was wonderful discussion. Yes. Very Thank nice. You. We also enjoyed a lot. Thank you. Uh, can you just we'll have a one group photograph before leaving? Yes. So yes. all participants are here. Ma'am, please. Uh, corona people, please.
Yes, ma'am. I think Ruchir is there, na? Ma'am, this is Piyush. The Piyush, please uh, have a photograph. Just give me one minute, ma'am. Done. Done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am and Pragati, ma'am. Thank you, Bhakti. Thank you, Sen Gupta, ma'am. Thank you, sir. It was really wonderful discussion. Yeah. Thank you, sir and ma'am, for shedding light on the various aspects of postmenopausal bleeding. and guiding the pg students on what they should keep in mind while presenting such cases thank you sir thank you ma'am for this wonderful discussion that we had regarding the case of really i should it was such a in depth discussion and it was such an interesting discussion so much to learn so much new things we learned from this discussion today really thank you dr virendra kumar thank you dr rajendra gupta and thank you party dai pare it was very nice presentation very very good discussion has evolved so really thank you lot of learning from this um, discussion we shall now proceed with the second session uh, it is the a session on pearls of wisdom an update on endometrial cancer by esteemed speaker respected dr nisha singh ma'am this session shall be chaired by our respected chairpersons dr chandan kachru ma'am and dr asha jain ma'am dr chandan kachru ma'am is a senior consultant and obstetrician and adolescent medicine consultant at cloud 9 hospital sector 47 in gurgaon uh, i will request dr asha and dr chandan to open their videos dr asha dr chandan Yes, Doctor Chandan has joined. Just give a call to her. Okay, I'll just give a call. Hi, Doctor Nisha Singh. Hi. <laughs> Good evening. So, so I'll just give a call to Doctor Chandan. Was she seen? Should mm -hmm. I introduce Doctor Nisha and start the program? Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. Good evening, ma'am. So. welcome dear dr nisha so she is unit head and in charge genital cancer control unit kgmc lucknow she is the vice president association of gynec oncologists of india vice president lucknow obstetric gynec society vp up state chapter of agai joint secretary aogen india member foxi hiv aids committee and has started hereditary gynec cancer clinic at kgmu she has a lot of experience she's had gynecology oncology trainings from stanford barts ruh canada and tmh mumbai she's had her endoscopy training from aims new delhi she has 24 projects more than 100 publications more than 15 chapters and she is the editor gynec onco module for up government 2023 nodal officer for trainings and cme in gynec onco for up government guest speaker more than 250 paper presentations more than 25 journal reviewer more than 40 she is organ help organize aogen india 2017 agaicon 22 upsc agai 23 more than 80 cmes and is a master's trainer in more than 17 trainings she has very many awards up state chapter award agai 2022 asia pacific medical excellence award appreciation certificate nhm up and mp asia top 50 academician award best paper oncology foxi 2010 and 22 best paper aogen india 2015 and 19 best faculty award 6th aba bharat jyoti award welcome dr nisha it's been great actually listening uh, reading your cv because 
we know you so well that we've really not been through the CV. So with such an illustrious CV, I am anxious, you know, and eager to listen to your talk on endometrial cancer. After that, scintillating case presentation and the examination of the student. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Asha. And thank you, Dr. Sushma and Dr. Pragati for inviting me here. And uh, I hope I do justice to the topic given to me. And uh, I think this slideshow has to be, uh, you know, unshared so that I can share my screen. So though I felt that uh, 30 minutes will be less for endometrial cancer, I've tried to make it uh, for the PG level. And so some slides, maybe I will just, um, can you see my slides? Yes, yeah, you can see your slides. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's full screen. Yeah, and I will also like to just, just a second, make this. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so uh, starting with endometrial cancer, as we have heard through the case discussion also, among the developing con developed countries, it is one of the most common gynae cancers. But in Indian women, it is the third most common. The median age at diagnosis is 63. That's why postmenopausal women. But over the last decade, we have seen an increase in the incidence in younger women. 80% are diagnosed in early stage, but still there are cases that are coming to us in advanced stage. Five-year survival rates are good for the localized disease, reaching 96%. But for regional and metastatic disease, the survival rates drop down. These are some of the pictures of various cases that we have had. Now, risk factors were discussed somewhat in the case presentation also, just to add to the list. Obesity, hypertension, diabetes was discussed, but chronic anovulation, tamoxifen therapy, presence of any estrogen-secreting tumor, endometrial hyperplasia was discussed as a precursor. Family history is important and history suggestive of Lynch syndrome, that is presence of any other cancer, which is part of the Lynch syndrome in the same woman, exposes her to the risk of CA endo also. There was some discussion on the role of screening. I think just see the nose. Asymptomatic women without risk factors, there is no screening recommended. Asymptomatic tamoxifen users also no screening recommended. Women who have a glandular cell tumor, if hysterectomy is not being done, then an endometrial aspiration is recommended. But if it is negative, no further screening. So where do we need the screening? So in general population, there is no role of screening, but if there is a woman who has a Lynch syndrome suspicion or a carrier of the Lynch 2 syndrome, then definitely surveillance by examination, TVS and endometrial aspiration annually, starting from 35 years of age is required. And you have to offer them prophylactic surgery, which will, which will include hysterectomy and bilateral salpingophorectomy to all these carriers at the age of 40 years. So that is what about we can say about the screening for CNO. Coming to the clinical features we have heard in the young and the perimenopausal women, it will be an abnormal uterine bleeding, usually amenorrhea followed by a prolonged and heavy bleeding. In postmenopausal women, it will be a postmenopausal bleeding. But remember, the advanced cases may present with something different. They may present with ascites, pleural effusion. So symptoms will be as per the site of metastasis. And then we get confused whether it is a CA ovary or it is a CA endometrium. So always in those cases also a detailed imaging of the, you have to see what is the endometrial thickness. Sometimes they may not even present with an abnormal bleeding. So these are rare cases, but yes, they do come. So diagnostic method, there was some discussion going on and uh, transvaginal sonography, of course, is the first step. Postmenopausal women, ET more than four, we talked about that. Premenopausal women, what is it then? See, because the ET will vary according to the phase of the menstrual cycle. So in secretory phase, they say 16 mm in the premenstrual, in the pre-ovulatory 8 mm. But even if it is not so, but the woman is not responding to medical management, there is a need to biopsy. Method of biopsy, as discussed, please do not say DNC. Endometrial aspiration is nowadays considered the best uh, with PEPEL, or you use a simple common scanula of 4 mm and attach it to a 20 cc syringe. You can we use it. I have been using it for years together, and it works wonders. 
the highest higher sensitivity for both C and O endometrial hyperplasia and a good specificity also. Of course, if there is a focal lesion or there you suspect a polyp, there is an irregular endometrium, then it is better to go for a hysteroscopic guided biopsy because that may be missed in the aspiration if it is just localized to one small area. So for discrete focal lesions, a hysteroscopic guided will be the first step. Transvaginal ultrasound with endometrial biopsy has a negative predictive value of 96%. So it's a good enough method for diagnosis. Now, precursor, they were talking about nowadays with the WHO 2014 classification, we have only two types of endometrial hyperplasia. One is without atypia, one is with atypia. Now, in the without atypia, the chances of coexistent CA endometrium or the concomitant concurrent is less than 1%, and the risk of progression is also less. Therefore, it's only the hyperplasia with atypia where there is a high risk 25 to 33% of coexistence. So your biopsy report is showing hyperplasia with atypia, but there may be carcinoma sitting somewhere. And also, even if not, the risk of progression is with the relative risk of 14 to 45. So that's how atypica, uh, hyperplasia with atypia is something serious. You need to take a definitive treatment approach. Talking about the WHO classification, we have seen endomet endometroid adenocarcinoma is most common, but probably not like 90%, little less. There are many others, just for you to remember, mucinous, serous, clear cell, undifferentiated, then neuroendocrine tumors, you know, lots of them. There are some mixed ones also, epithelial and mesenchymal tumors of the uterus. Then the histopathological grading was commented upon, which is very important. So they Grade 1 are the well-differentiated, grade 2 moderately differentiated, grade 3 poorly. This is depending upon what is the percentage of non-squamous or non-modular growth, solid growth pattern in the tissue. So if it is less than 5% G1, 6 to 50% G2 and more than 50% is G3. So there is a good agreement on the tumor grade in the endometrial sampling and the final histopath. Of course, it will be higher with the hysteroscopic. So therefore, it is important that we get the grade in the endometrial biopsy tissue itself to help us decide, tailor our surgery. I'm starting from the figure 2009 staging because still the books that we had of last year, we would be having this staging. It was a very simple kind of anatomical staging that stage one, limited to endometrium and uh, limited to the uterus, 1A endometrium, 1B invasion to uh, myometrium. Uh, 1A included the less than half myometrium also. Then two for the cervix, three was mainly the local uh, extension and then and the lymph nodes and four was the distant. There is no mention in this staging of any other aspects, the biological behavior of the disease the grade of the lesion, aggressive, non-aggressive, and some more things we'll just talk about. So this was the FIGO 2009 staging, which we all had been reading. And then came the prognostic classification, the type 1, type 2, which was included in the case discussion, the estrogen-dependent tumors and the tumors which are usually have a good prognosis and present in early stages. They are associated with mutation P10 and KDAS. And in contrast, the type 2, which are poor prognosis cancers and P53 mutation was associated. After that came the risk stratification based on these things and also the lymphovascular space invasion. So it was classified into low risk, intermediate risk, high intermediate and the high risk, which were helping us to take decisions on the uh, adjuvant therapies, which the questions were being asked from the PGs that what will you do after surgery? So there was this risk stratification, but again, it was depending upon the stage, the grade and the uh, LVSI mainly. Now what happened came this molecular classification of endometrial carcinoma once the cancer genome at least classification came and we got these four types of genetic mutations in the endometrial cancer, which have changed the whole scenario. There is one polymutated, which is considered to be a very good prognosis disease where the response, you know, even if it is stage two, the prognosis is good. Then there is a mismatch repair deficient, so MMRD, which are more related with the hereditary ones. Then there is a T53 mutation, which if present has a poor prognosis. So even if it is in the early stage, the prognosis is poorer. And there is this 
non-specific molecular, molecular profile, which is the low copy number. Now, I'm not going into details, but for the PGs, just to know that there is something like molecular classification, which has come up. And based on that, a new staging has come up. Now, this molecular classification, if you have facility to do all that, you know, you should first do the pole testing. If the pole mutation is positive, then it, it is labeled as endometrial carcinoma, poly mutated. If it is not, then you do the MMR, where if it is MMR deficient, then it becomes the MMR deficient ones. If that is also not there, then you do the P53. And based on that, you have either the P53 mutated or you have the NSM. So now, as I said, the new staging has come up just in this year itself. The FIGO has introduced it. And the aspect that have been included are the molecular classification. And also, they have put staging according to histological type, aggressive and non-aggressive. And they can both upstage or downstage the disease. And so now the management protocols also will change according to these. So wherever facilities are available, they have to be incorporated in the final diagnosis of the disease. So just pay some attention on the FIGO 2023 staging because in first go, when you read it, you find it very difficult, but it is not so difficult. I'll try to spend some time on this. So according to this, the stage one is now confined to the uterine corpus, as we said in the previous staging, but ovary has been added. I'll talk about it why. Now 1A disease is further classified into 1A1, 1A2, 1A3. What is 1A1? Non-aggressive, that is your endometroid grade one, grade two, all right? Non-aggressive is endometroid type grade one, grade two, which is limited to an endometrial polyp or is confined to endometrium. That's okay. 1A2 is the same type of histology, but has extended to the myometrium, but less than half of the myometrium and no focal LVSI. 1A3 is a disease, which is a low-grade endometroid carcinoma limited to the uterus, but simultaneously, there may be a disease in one of the ovaries, unilateral disease inside the ovary, not involving the surface of the uh, surface of the ovary. Then that is taken. And now the concept is that this is not considered a metastasis, but because the risk factors are similar, it may be a de novo disease in the two places, the synchronous, which we used to call previously. So if there are some criteria. I'll come to them. So if those criteria are fulfilled, it remains in stage 1A3. That is an early stage. But if they are not filled, then it come, becomes a metastatic disease. So I'll come to that a little later in more detail. 1B is a non-aggressive histological type with invasion of half or more of the myometrium. That is more than half with no or focal LVSI. Now, LVSI also, they say no or focal when it is less than five vessels involved. Then 1C is aggressive histological type. So if the histo only the histology is different, which is aggressive, it even if it is confined to the endometrium, it becomes 1C disease. I hope that is clear. But after I complete my session, if there are any queries on this, I'll be happy to answer that. Stage 2 is invasion of cervical stroma. So we have stage 2A, B, and C. A is invasion of cervical stroma of non-aggressive type. Stage 2B is substantial LVSI is present. So now LVSI has come up, but the, the histology is non-aggressive. Stage 2C is aggressive histology with any myometrium. So if there is aggressive histology with confined to the endometrium, it is in stage 1, 1C. If it is in involving myometrium at all, even if little myometrial or not, it straight away becomes a stage 2C disease. Makes sense. Then stage 3 where you have the involvement, the local spread of the disease. Now remember stage three and four are the advanced stages where the molecular classification has not done much change to. So 3A is invasion of the uterine serosa, adnexa by direct extension or metastasis. So 3A1 is spreading to the ovary and the fallopian tube, that is the adnexa. And this is, yeah, this is where the, uh, the criteria for 1A1 are not meeting. I'll repeat them later. 3A2 is involvement of the uterine serosa, sub serosa spread through the uterine serosa. Now 3B is uh, metastasis or spread to the vagina or to the parametrium and pelvic peritoneum also. So previously parametrium was not uh, included in the 
CA endometrium staging. But here in stage 3B, the parametrium has been commented upon. So 3 uh, B1 is your uh, metastasis to the vagina or the parametrium. B2 is metastasis to pelvic peritoneum. Once the disease becomes uh, goes to the lymph nodes, then pelvic or parietic, it is stage 3C disease. That's why when we are deciding to do the lymph nodes, it is for staging purposes. Then if the lymph nodes come positive, straight away it becomes a stage 3 disease. So 3C1 is pelvic nodes, 3C2 is parietic lymph nodes, and uh, further divided into micrometastasis and macrometastasis. And here, this micro and macro is not whether you can see it with your eyes or not, it is uh, up to 2 mm is micrometastasis and more than 2 mm is macrometastasis. And then stage 4 disease is, uh, of course, advanced disease. But, you know, it is still in the pelvis. If it is the bladder or the intestinal mucosa, it is 4A. So it is still in the pelvis, but it is stage 4A. If it goes to the abdominal, uh, it leaves the peritoneum, goes to the abdominal peritoneum, then also it is stage 4 disease. So that's the difference between, you know, like when you see CA ovary or something. Stage 4C when there is a distant metastasis. So disease of endometrium going to the abdomen also is a stage 4 disease. So some other important points which I was mentioning. The first one that was the stage 1A3. That is when you have a disease limited to the uterus, but there is a lesion in the unilateral ovary. It is a synchronous tumor and that's why it remains in stage 1A3. The criteria to say this are uh, no more than superficial myometrial invasion. So myometrial invasion should be less than 50%, absence of any LVSI, absence of additional metastasis. And the ovarian tumor is unilateral, limited to the ovary without capsule invasion or rupture. Then a point about the grade and histology. As I said, endometrioid adenocarcinoma grade 1, grade 2 is non-aggressive and rest is aggressive. And for the endometrioid adenocarcinoma grade is based on the proportion of solid areas, which also I mentioned. Now, LVSI, as I said, more than five vessels involved will be called a substantial LVSI. Less than that will be uh, a focal or nil. Then macrometastasis, this also I told. There are a few more other important points that presence of any unusual nuclear ATPR, it directs you towards evaluation of P53 because it is a poor prognostic marker. Then adenocarcinomas with squamous differentiated will be graded according to the glandular component. Now, where molecular uh, profiling works best is in the high-grade endometroid adenocarcinoma. So in the endometroid type, if the grade is three, then here, molecular addition of the molecular profile, whether it is poly or it is P53, this will make the huge change. So this is the uh, category where maximum role of molecular profile will be there. So if you have the facilities in most places, I'll tell you with the IHC, like in my institute also, with the IHC as a surrogate marker, they can look for P53 mutation, they can look for MMR. Only poly mutation is not available. So if people ask, most of the pathologists will be able to give these two. But poly, only few high-level centers will be having. So this helps us in giving, uh, you know, if it is there, then you, when this uh, molecular, uh, uh, you know, it comes poly or uh, P53 or MMRD, then you label it as the stage. Along with that, you put the, uh, M that is molecular and then what mutation is there like for p53 you'll write 2cm p53 abnormal so you can see that and so for practical purposes and to avoid under treatment if the molecular classification is unknown then high grade eec will be grouped together with aggressive that's why we said uh, grade 3 endometroid will go as aggressive so automatically the staging will get upgraded now coming to the treatment part, how will you treat? Surgical staging will be required. So it's a comprehensive surgical staging. You'll give a midline vertical incision. You will take peritoneal washings, although there is no mention of peritoneal washings in the staging, but this will continue because times to come, we may change our staging further. Thorough exploration of the peritoneal cavity for any evidence of gross metastatic disease. If it's not there, what you do is an extrafacial hysterectomy with bilateral salpingoophorectomy and then the lymphadenectomy, which are the cases to be done, we'll just come to that. 
Previously, people said if cervix is involved, do a radical hysterectomy, just like cervical. That is not the concept now. Omentectomy will be done in cases of uterine papillary serous cancer. So when there is a serous cancer, it behaves like ovarian. And there, or if there is a metastatic disease, obviously you will have to do that. So now coming to lymphadenectomy, what are the indications? If the tumor size is more than two centimeter, if the myometrium more than half is involved, if it is a moderately or poorly differentiated disease, if it is aggressive histological subtype, if it is cervix or adnexal involvement, if there are enlarged pelvic parietic nodes. Now, out of all this, how will you decide all this? You should know this preoperatively. So some of the features will come in the endometrial biopsy report. That is the histology, the grade, the molecular profile, which is not yet added, and the LVSI also actually comes here only. So these four things should be there now if we are getting a histopathology. We should discuss with our pathology friends and ask them to give that. And you know, you do it and it will be it will happen gradually. Then rest of the things, the myometrial involvement, uh, cervical involvement, adnexal involvement, all this and the lymph nodes, this will come from the imaging. So contrast enhanced MRI is a good modality to look for all those things. And then on the basis of this, we will decide whether we'd go for a lymphadenectomy or not. Now, so a preoperative MRI will be very useful. High sensitivity accuracy is good to do that. Now there have been, what about if you do not have a good this thing or when you open, you are finding something different. You know, your MRI said it is limited to endometrium, but now you are finding what to do now. So now on gross examination, you can see, but if you have frozen facility, intraoperative frozen can help you in both, uh, in all of these further. So there are studies which have shown that this are, these are good methods, frozen section. If you have the facility, you can confirm that better than the gross examination. Then what is the role of this lymphadenectomy? One should understand. See, the one role is to stage the disease because gross disease is not there, but lymph nodes come positive because the risk of lymph node metastasis is high in, the, in all those conditions where we have said lymph nodes should be done. So that will upstage the disease. So your adjuvant treatment will be decided on that. But apart from that, and, you know, therapeutic advantage is there only in the advanced disease. So in early stage disease, there's no, no benefit in the overall or recurrence-free survival. Lymphadenectomy, therefore, is not recommended in the early stage endometroid. I mean, whatever uh, criteria we give. Then uh, the parioteic lymph node survival benefit is there in the intermediate or high-risk disease and benefit increases with high, grade, high tumor grades. So as I said in the... Uh, high risk disease in the intermediate uh, risk disease, it, which also means a higher stage disease, it will help you. Then there is a role of sentinel node biopsy, which can be done to, uh, you know, reduce the morbidity of complete lymphadenectomy. So that can be done wherever facilities are available. I'll not go in details, but a lot of work has been done and it has been found to be useful. C endo is one where it is really useful. Now, treatment modality, there was a question. Minimal invasive surgery should be embraced as the standard surgical uh, approach wherever expertise is available. If you're doing open because you don't do lab doesn't mean you're doing wrong. But point is those who are doing lab, lab is good enough if they have the expertise. Power morselation should not be used. Robotic assisted lab staging is also feasible and a safe alternative. Then there are uh, trials, so I'll not going to just remember there are some good evidences available for what we are saying. So the GOG lab 2 trial was there and the update has also come, which shows that the long-term survivals are also good. Similarly, in the Cochrane reviews, lab versus laparotomy and uh, robotic versus laparotomy. So a lot of studies are there and not just the perioperative outcomes, even the oncologic outcomes and are good enough with these modalities. Vaginal approach, there was a question on. So uh, see approach for uh, a retrospective study is there, which is a little old one, which has shown that it can be in, but then in select patients only. And it is appropriate maybe for early stage endometroid cases where you don't have any doubt of, you know, need for lymph node. And, but then to be very sure, I feel is very difficult always because we are, uh, basing our decision preoperatively on uh, imaging and uh, 
histopathology, which also may may not be hundred percent quite good, but then going for uh, vaginal, that is how the point will be there. So now coming to what to do after the surgery. After the surgery, who will need uh, adjuvant therapy? Who will not? So if it's a low risk disease, which uh, stratification I told. See, at present we have that one only. Now with the molecular profiling, we will have some more changes in these tables also in times to come. So in low risk disease, you can just observe, but if it is low intermediate, but there is only a single risk factor you may observe, but if it is a high intermediate disease, two or more risk factors like age more than 60, deep myometrial invasion, LVSI grade three. So here vaginal brachytherapy is required, what Sir was asking. So that is a vaginal brachytherapy to prevent the local recurrence. But if it is a high risk disease, then in those cases, the external beam radiation therapy or a combination of chemo radiation, depending upon the stage of the disease and the type of risk factor will be required. In advanced disease, it will be chemotherapy alone, even radiotherapy will not be working and they will need palliation or something. So this is also based on a lot of trials. The POTEC trials, sometimes PGs may be asked, POTEC 1, which showed that the impact of post-operative brachytherapy on local regional recurrence seems to be limited and low risk. So here you do not need to give. In the, uh, uh, yeah, the POTEC 2 told us that Vaginal brachytherapy ensures vaginal control with fewer GI toxic effects, adjuvant treatment of choice in high intermediate risk group. And then about chemotherapy, early stage, it does not have any uh, particular role in improving the survival. In high-risk disease, yes, it is. And in advanced, as I said, only chemo. And what we give, as Sir said, carboplatin, paclitaxel, six cycles is the standard of care. Combined chemo radiation, the POTEC-3 trial and the GOG-253, so 58 trial were there, highly efficacious in cases of uh, cases with higher chances of ref, uh, recurrence. So there, advanced disease with very poor prognosis, you may get the combination. Talking about hormone therapy, no survival benefit in the meta-analysis has been found. And uh, only in some recurrence cases, also if you are planning to give, you retest it and look for ER receptors. So there only it will be actually useful. Now, this is a slide showing based on the adjuvant treatment based on molecular classification. Now, this is the only good thing to remember that if it is poly mutated, even if it is stage one, two, three, no adjuvant therapy, because so that is the de escalation. So, a lot and lot of work is being done and a lot of more information. But for PGs, I don't want to load you with that. Just have an idea that these things are coming up and they will change the uh, protocols further. So there are some double classifiers also. Sometimes if we have both P53 and pole mute, remember pole mute has a better uh, prognosis, uh, even in combination. Similarly, MMRD with P53, MMRD has a better prognosis. So, okay. Now coming to these two, these two are important. Now surgically or medically inoperable disease, as they were talking about new adjuvant chemotherapy, yes. If it is an advanced disease, you do a new adjuvant chemo, chemo for three cycles, see the operability, take up. So just like in ovarian, you can go for these cases. Then there is another situation, diagnosis post hysterectomy. This I want PGs to remember. Many times when people do a hysterectomy without a good endometrial biopsy, without any emphasis on the intraoperative care, they just do a hysterectomy and post-op you got the disease now. What to do now? Now, in that case, if it is a grade three lesion, there is a deep myometrial invasion on the final histopath, then additional surgery is required to remove the adnexa and the lymph node, or you directly give external beam radiation. But if it was a disease which was grade one or two endometroid with no myometrial invasion, LVSI was negative, then maybe those cases may be left for follow up, but not sitting at home every three months and look for any. Uh, recurrence at any time and then you so that is this is an important component because it happens many a times now uh, role of uh, fertility preservation just to tell you there are you will read articles there are a lot of this thing but patients should be counseled clearly there will be select patients who can go for it they should know that the standard treatment is complete surgery all the risk and benefits should be explained and then only you should offer and only experts should offer and it should be in, you know, uh, it should be an MDT, multidisciplinary team decision. 
So I'll, I don't want PGs to the drugs that we have are um, progesterone based therapies, LNG, IUS with medroxy progesterone acetate. So, um, but or magistral acetate, not telling you much about, but finally, if she conceives and has a baby later, a completion surgery required. Ovarian preservation can be offered in younger women if the woman is less than 45, but and the disease is grade one endometrioid edit endometrial carcinoma with myometrial invasion less than 50 and no obvious ovarian or extra uterine. It may be offered in these women. Now coming to the post-treatment surveillance. Uh, as you know, any malignancy risk of recurrence is maximum in the first two to three years. So a very close follow-up is required. Every time she comes, every three months, you do a clinical examination, look for symptoms, examination findings. Imaging will be needed only when there are any uh, symptoms or signs. Uh, initially, you do it three monthly for first two years, then every six months or annually, depending upon the symptoms. And genetic counseling for patients who have a family history suggestive of Lynch syndrome should be done in this time now, after she has been treated. Management of recurrence, mostly if it is a localized disease, then surgery can work. But if she has not had RT previously, RT is good for her now. And if it is diffuse disease, then also RT or chemotherapy, not going into details again. Survival rates stage-wise are, you know, the previous data only. Newer ones will come later. Role of MHT, yeah. Menopausal hormone therapy can be given or not. So, you know, in CA endo, of course, you will think you will go give estrogen, it is going to further. So don't give in the first two to three years where the risk of recurrence is maximum. And after that, maybe some symptomatic treatment may be given. Uh, so that was it. The take-home messages. Incidence is increasing with changing lifestyle. Tissue diagnosis by EA with the type and grade is important. Pre-op CEMRI for the extent of disease so that you can tailor your surgery. Lymphadenectomy particularly for staging is important. SLN biopsy may be done, may replace the complete lymph node dis uh, dissection and MIS has to be embraced. Vaginal brachytherapy for intermediate risk, EBRT for high risk and chemo for advanced stage disease. Follow up and all I have already talked. Thank you so much for this patient hearing. If any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Nisha. I mean, uh, this should go with all the uh, PG students as uh, the presentation for their preparation. They don't need to go to the books. I think it's quite exhaustive. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, today only we saw one patient. She's just 37 years old. She's uh, trying to conceive, PCOD patient. And uh, the last ultrasound showed some polypoidal growth. And we took a biopsy and today we got the report as an endometrial cancer yes. so unfortunate because she was under treatment for pcod for one and a half years so very very you're right that it is coming in the young age group yes. and um, we should be very careful in treating the cases also uh, like you said that the biopsies are very important the pre-op uh, you know mri needed for proper staging should be done and uh, i think involvement of an onco gyno onco surgeon is very important i i think medical legally also we will be in a safer you know environment um, rather than doing it ourselves because we are doing right left um, you know hysterectomies and i suppose better um, staging and better management we should have a you know proper onco surgeon with us and uh, uh, for the fertility preservation i would like to ask you uh, you said that uh, we have uh, we, we have to have the patient selection. So, uh, can we offer uh, this patient? Uh, fit, uh, how how can we offer the fertility pre preservation to this patient, which we saw, you know, in which we were treating? So, as I said, that you know, because it is a medical management, everybody feels anybody can give it to any of the patients who come. That's why I said it is very important a proper counseling. So again, looking at all those factors, does she fit into that? The histological type, the grade, the myometrial invasion, all that will first. So it has to be a disease limited to the endometrium only. 
it has to be an endometroid, it has to be a grade one, grade two disease. So that is first regarding the disease. Then the patient has to know that this is not the right treatment. The right treatment is a uh, hysterectomy only, but because she wants, so she has to understand that whatever treatment we give, it may work, it may not work. If it fails, or this may increase during that course. So she will be on a very close follow-up. We'll have to repeat the biopsies. And, uh, you know, if there is, it goes away, then there will be a trial of, trial of conception. So all that is very important. Then only, so the treatment will be, it, it can be given. So um, you have to see all those things and then take a decision. So involvement onco fertility, uh, onco surgeon and also, also a fertility expert. What can they give for the ovulation induction? Because you can't leave her on a normal spontaneous then if yeah. you are doing like that. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Dr. Pragati, for inviting me for this wonderful session. Really uh, exhaustive and very nice. Interesting. It is our pleasure. <laughs> it's a question. Thank you, Dr. Nisha. So that was so good. But, you know, I want to add one thing to your armometrium. You said that you have to do a contrast-enhanced MRI for diagnosis. For spread, okay. But as far as local disease, a 3D ultrasound works so well. You know, with Doppler, you put the correct PRF at 0.3 or 0.4, put in a Doppler and do a 3D. You can see the complete extent of disease. You can make out preoperatively how much of the myometrium is involved, whether the cervix is involved, whether it is going into the parametrium. Because when you're doing a good power Doppler, along with a 3D means I have been able to diagnose 90% of my patients, 100% correct in this manner. It's only one patient who was 34 years old and 140 kg. Means oh. we, I, I couldn't really do anything for her. We got that, yes, she is endometrial car carcinoma. We had to get her operated and it turned out an early stage disease, but she was Lynch syndrome. So, the basic thing is, we as gynecologists are so used to looking at the uterus that we should put in that probe. And today, almost every machine has that Doppler capacity. Train your eyes because what your eyes don't, your mind doesn't know, your eyes will not see. But you can definitely make a very good diagnosis wherever you are. So, so uh, Dr. Ashwin, and it was a great refresher for me, you know, <laughs> it reminded everything. Yes. So actually, this was a PG session. That's why for many things, I stayed on, you know, the standard things. But of course, because if you see like for CA cervix also, they are talking about, you know, use of uterus for the parametrium and all that. So there are a lot of things that are coming up. I try to put some, some not, you know, it becomes try. We just try yeah, to. But actually that. today, every CV a gynecologist is allowed to do ultrasound <coughs> because of their PG training only. So That's they should true. actually get it into their heads what that machine in their hand can do. True. And I, I understand because Dr. Virin in the uh, case discussion also said, so gynecologists have to learn to do their own scans and then looking uh, at the material uh, thickness, extent, everything. So obviously, this is an additional thing that, but lymph nodes may or may not be, I do not know. Agreed. Agreed. That's, that's what I said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, doctor, See, if the, more than half endometrium is in myometrium, you're going to go for an MRI anyway. But what I'm saying is in routine cases, you know, where you said that so many patients are getting operated without a diagnosis. Right. So if you have done a good quality scan, you will be able to guess. Put in a Doppler, you can see the vasculature. You can see the break in continuity. Dr. Pragati Thank was you, Dr. Thinking. Pragati, for having me here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bhakti. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Nisha and Dr. Kachru, ma'am, for being here. Thank you so much. We so, gained knowledge. He's also there on the board. So, sir, you want to put in some ex uh, special comment? I think he, he is there. So, anyway. So, it was really... A very thought provoking and very in depth discussion. Really good. Yeah. So, should I'm I should sure. proceed with my vote of thanks, I suppose. Right, Mega? 
Yes, ma'am. We thank all these speakers for uh, being here tonight and the chairpersons for sharing the session. Now, I request uh, Dr. Pragati Kharatkar, ma'am, to please offer a vote of thanks for the night. So, it is really indeed a pleasure as the year is coming to an end. So, people are looking after the coming year, but I always, I am always, you know, in a feeling of gratitude that this whole year has given me so much. So much things I have learned. I have met so many people. I have learned so much from them. So I, my gratitude to the last passing year. And so happy to meet my all dear friends on this PG Star Board. My God. This program. I am secretary to Nagpur OBGY Society. And this is my favorite program of the year. Very meticulously our team. PG Star team has worked. And um, this was our 17th session. So my thanks to DMMIS for presenting the case, getting associated with us, all the medical colleges around Nagpur, that is GMC, IGMC, uh, DMMIS, Lata Mangeshkar Hospital, and uh, AIMS Nagpur have all collaborated and come in for this PG STAR activity. And very glad to inform all the uh, people who have logged in and all the guests who are here that our viewership was in the tune of 800 to 1000. Great. And had global delegates as well. Global students were also benefited with this unique program. So we feel so, you know, so thankful and we feel so satisfied in conducting this program. So for today's speaker, Dr. Nisha Singh, my dear friend, I was just trying to get you on this program and at last in this year I could do that. Thank yeah. you so much for your so elaborative talk. Today's chairperson, Dr. Chandan Pachu and Dr. Asha Jain. Thank you so much. Uh, my your tips were so good, Dr. Asha Jain and Dr. Chandan was busy and I pulled her and immediately she was busy. And, uh, <laughs> and so many times we were missing the train that I was to want to call her in the Nagpur OBJ program and then we are here. So we are so grateful. Today's um, expert examiner, Dr. Virendra Kumar, sir. Sir, you have thrown such a light and so practical tips provided, not only to the PGs, but for the practitioners like us. And definitely it will be beneficial in our day-to-day -day practice. Thank you, madam. Dr. Swati, you presented the case well. And Dr. Bega, thank, thank you sir. for being the MOC. And I should really ask all to give a standing oration to our PG star team. Dr. Bhakti Guzar, Dr. Prachi Dixit, and Dr. headed by Dr. Anuja Bhalirao. They are doing beautiful job. Whole program is talked. Dates are getting clashed. Festival season, carnival season. But the but PG star does do happen. Thank you so much. And all the delegates who have logged in, thank you so much for logging in the program and shortly we'll get the link of this program so it can be circulated in your respective groups. Thank you. Thank you and wish you a very happy coming year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much everyone. Happy New Year. Happy Thank New Year. You. Happy Thank you. Year. With this we come to an end. Core Connect. Team Core Connect. Thank you for connecting with Energy. Yes. Arush for connecting. They are working so tirelessly. They make up a flyers and post them at time and then they send the link. So thank you so much. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Thanks a lot. So our live is off live. Dr. Nisha, stay back. Dr. Chandan, stay back. Okay. Uh, Corona is on. Live is off. Sorry, I just.